On today's program, some news you may have missed. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. One of the things that I have to do in preparing this show each and every day is to occasionally go through the news of the day or the news of the past several days and try to look up some stories. I know some of which you've heard, maybe some you've read, maybe somebody shared something with you, a friend, and then some of those stories that maybe you missed or maybe it didn't mean a whole lot to you when you first saw the headline. And I've got a few that are kind of like that today. Want to share a few stories and then some of the strange things that go on in the world of education, especially at the collegiate level, university level. Honestly, I'm beginning to think that, I look, I can remember going back 50 years ago being told how important having good grades and getting a decent college education would be and what it could mean for an individual. Today, we have cheapened a college degree with these idiotic, woke universities full of people that are nothing but indoctrination monsters that are filling the minds of young people with pure, with, with pure sewage. Just literally woke and indecent sewage. And, and these are the people that get these huge salaries and tenure cost of a college education is rapidly farther paced inflation than anything else I can think of. Why? Because of federally guaranteed student loans. And so we have people studying all kind of stupid and silly things of no value, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, being deeply in debt, and then they're lucky to get a job as a cashier at Walmart or a greeter, um, you know, at Burger King that's about all they're qualified to do. But there are some news stories. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But I do want to share a couple of news stories that I think are something you need to know. And, 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 and it should be a concerning one. This kind of slip between the cracks, so to speak. An operator of a major pipeline system that transports fuel across the East Coast said this past Saturday... It had been victimized by a ransomware attack and it halted all pipeline operations to deal with that threat. Now, they are saying the attack is unlikely to affect gasoline supply and prices unless somehow it would lead to a a prolonged shutdown of the pipeline. Now, I used to work in emergency management a number of years ago, and one of the critical infrastructures we were always concerned about dealing with were underground pipelines. A lot of people, a lot of you don't even think about them much, but they are a vital part of our economy. In this case, it was Colonial Pipeline. I've dealt with them before. In the county in which I served, they had, wow, a surprising number of buried pipelines coming through our county that most people probably never knew were there. I mean, we're talking major distribution pipelines. We're talking natural gas. We are talking oil. We are talking diesel. We're talking a lot of stuff. Colonial Pipeline. Now, they they didn't say what was demanded or who made the demand. Ransomware attacks, as many of you may already know, are carried out by hackers, and their whole idea is to scramble your data And it paralyzes the victim's network, and they demand a large sum to decrypt it. Now, nine times out of ten, you pay the money, and you're still dead in the water. Because once they've destroyed your data, why do they care about fixing it? They got your money. This attack on a company which delivers about 45% of of the fuel consumed on the East Coast underscores just how vulnerable so much of our nation's critical infrastructure actually is. And I knew these things back in my days in emergency management. We worried about people attacking the line itself, even though they're buried. And now we're finding out they can, you know, do it from from China, probably, or North Korea, messing with these systems. And, and here's what bothers me. See, in this case, Colonial 
said the ransomware occurred this past Friday, affected some of its information technology, da, the Internet, and the company moved proactively, that's their word, to take certain systems offline. In essence, that halted all the operations. Now, Colonial Pipeline, they're based out of north of Atlanta, Georgia, a town called Alpharetta, if I, if I recall. And they're, they're, they're a pretty big operation. Like I said, in the county in which I live, massive fuel lines run underground to move, well, gasoline uh, better than in trucks. Ransomware, it's becoming a bigger problem. And really, we need to stop and think in terms of just how much it's costing us. I wonder how many times we didn't hear about a hospital, uh, private businesses, even some, some local governments, and, and many public schools potentially have been nailed by ransomware. I'm sure that a lot of these stories rarely, rarely ever become big news. And for obvious reasons, if you knew some of the stuff that's going on in, in, in the cyber world, you, you'd be pretty scared. Average ransomware paid in the United States has jumped, you know, typical businesses. You know, some of these places are getting nailed for like three quarters of a million dollars. The average downtime is 21 days, 21 days. And that's assuming, and once again, what you got to remember is it's not because they they foolishly, I think the city of Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken, I'm almost positive it was Atlanta, paid out like a million dollars in ransomware. And after the money was gone, basically the overseas crooks were like, <laughs> yeah, like we're really going to fix this? You, you guys are out of your mind. And for days, their systems were down. This has happened to a lot of governments that have poor planning. And I've seen poor planning in the work that I did with some municipal governments. I I know one place where the main server that did everything for the taxes and, you know, the entire operation of a city and another place, a county, you could see the servers from a window on a second floor window. You could have shot them out with a shotgun and put them offline. They were not even storing their data, backup data off site. They were literally in this particular city's case. Now, they, they, they kind of figured that they just had it in somebody's desk drawer. And that's back when they had tape about 10, 12 years ago. So there's a lot of government doesn't sometimes really even understand the fullness of, of the threat. The attacks, they're extremely sophisticated these days. And they were able to defeat some pretty sophisticated security or the right degree of secu- uh, security just weren't in place. We don't know which. Here's what I worry about, and I think this is a legitimate concern on my part. I hope you think that it is. Let me ask a question. How secure do you think our power grid is? How, do you, how secure do you think anything is these days? I think we have been put into a false sense of security over the years. I know that I know what I use to protect my computers, and it seems to be working. And I know some of the costlier versions of things don't work near as well. I think it was somebody that said, you know, so here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a virus for your computer and then sell you a, a software to get rid of the virus that we created. And there are times I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a ring of truth in that expression. Yeah, we have some security risk. Look at what happened. And, and, we're, and we're becoming dependent upon wind and solar. Wind energy. Solar energy. We don't want to have those dirty, you know, dirty plants that make electricity. We want electric cars. So we're going to need more electricity. So we need more wind and more solar. It'll never meet the demand no matter what they're telling you. Really, they're planning for a day when you get to use less of everything, eat less, especially less meat, and hopefully die younger so you're not a useless eater on this planet. This is where we're coming to. And it all begins with a really good woke education in a public school and then 
a state-funded university or college. Now, there are some private universities that are super woke, super, super, super leftist. And then there are, thankfully, a handful of colleges that I respect that are neither, quote, woke, uh, they are not into leftist ideology, and I even congratulate some that won't touch a penny of federal money. Those are the ones that have some courage. Ran across this story and some audio to go with it, and I think you're going to get a kick out of this. A professor at, of course, a Southern California college Yep, good old Southern California. It's caught on a video. That's the beauty of having all this uh, learning at a distance on Zoom. Because uh, it's kind of hard to hide things. This particular professor was very confrontational with one of her students. After he called police officers, generally speaking, heroes. Now, obviously, this particular professorette thoroughly disagreed. Cypress College is the place. The student's name is uh, Braden Ellis. And he had a presentation on how the cancel culture is destructive and tearing our nation apart. Now, during a communications class, this was a comm class. I remember taking those, oh, I don't know, 45 years ago. Uh, Ellis cited the example of a, a Paw Patrol, a cartoon about search and rescue dogs aimed at children ages, you know, two and up. And last June, this, this outra- there's an outrage mob. They, they wanted to cancel the program because one of the dogs, oh, yeah, isn't this, this is going to be terrible. This is just horrendous. One of the dogs on this kid's show uh, depicted a police in a positive manner. What a crime against humanity, depicting a police officer in a positive manner. Ellis said that after the presentation... There was about a 10-minute question and answer session, which is when this professorette, this woke professor, ignorant little slob that she is, you know, just barfing out, puking up her lack of knowledge and wisdom, attacking this student, and just disagreed when he said that a good majority of police officers are, are actually heroes. And she just got just crazy. The professor can be heard on this Zoom conference, you can actually see a video, telling the student that the issue with the police is systemic. Isn't that the word of the day, systemic? We have systemic racism, systemic whiteness, systemic everything. Systemic, systemic, systemic. Say that three times fast. So listen to some of her, this is some of her total silliness uh, when, when he had finished up listen carefully to what she had to say you brought up the police in your speech a few times um so what is your like what is your main concern since i mean honestly the whole reason police i mean it's it it is systemic the issue is systemic because the whole reason we have police departments in the first place where did it stem from what's our history going back to what jeremy was talking about what where was what does it stem from it stems from People in the South wanting to capture runaway slaves. Okay, obviously, uh, this college professor failed history or just makes stuff up as she goes along. The first police forces came around in the 1850s in places like New York, Cincinnati, places that didn't have slavery. So don't give me this nonsense that this was all done to bring back errant slaves in the South. There were no police departments in the South. So you're beginning, you're already starting with a false premise. Now, another another classmate chimed in, uh, which you're about to hear in just a second, and, and said, maybe uh, the police shouldn't be labeled as heroes. Maybe they don't belong even on a kid's show, is what they, this, this one kid says. Maybe they shouldn't be heroes. Maybe they don't belong on a kid's show. Uh, so I disagree with the what Jeremy, Jeremy said about it, because... Uh, I think cops are heroes and they have to have a difficult job, but we have to have all of them. Now, notice that this leftist professor interrupts with all of them, all police, all police. You can tell how much she hates all police. And here's how 
Here's how Ellis responded. I mean, I'd say uh, a good majority of them. You have bad people in every business and every yeah, part. Yeah, oh, well, wait, a wait, lot wait, of wait, police wait. officers have committed atrocious crimes and have gotten away with it and have never been convicted of any of it. Now, once again, this overpaid professor uh, at a college just simply interrupts because their opinion is more enlightened than your opinion always is. And she can't stand the idea of anybody having the slightest appreciation for police or or even a person that thinks for themselves. She seems to think that virtually all police are corrupt. Sorry, Professor. You're the one that is corrupt in your thinking and reasoning. It's, it's, it's provable. Listen to just a little bit more of some of the nonsense she spouts. And this is what I believe. This is my opinion. And this is, you know, not popular to say, but uh, I do support our police. And we have bad people. And the people that do bad things should be brought to justice. I agree with that. But I think that, uh, say, I'm saying it again. They haven't. Well, I agree with you on that point of they should, right? Okay, so what is and your bottom line point? You're saying police officers should be revered, viewed as heroes. They I, belong I on TV shows with children. That I think they are happen. heroes in a sense because they come to your need and they come and help you. And they have a problem just like every other business, but we should fix that. But I think business. they're they're heroes. Well, they're, I think that's the problem is looking at it as a business. Because they're actually supposed to protect and serve the people. They do protect us. Who do we call when we're in trouble and someone has a knife or a gun? I would call the police. Now, I got to call that out. If you think for one second, if somebody was breaking into her home or was trying to run off with, run her off the road in a pick up truck or stole her car, you, you don't think she'd be getting on that little iPhone and calling the police? You got to be crazy. Listen to the rest of the, this clip and just how crazy this lady is. Why wouldn't you call the police? I don't trust them. My life's in more danger. Who would you call? In their presence. Professor, who would you call? I wouldn't call anybody. Well, would you have, if someone intruded your house off. with a gun, what would, you, would you have a gun on you? Or no. who would you call? It's my time to go. Okay. okay. Well, I'm not going to do you already in the house with a gun. There's not much you can do at that point. Calling the police is kind of just, you know. And I know that it's not popular for me to say that to you guys and, and people in here, but that's what I believe about the police. Okay, and, thank you. I appreciate um, it. Thank you, thank guys, you very much. for listening to my point. I appreciate it. Thanks. I will say, yeah, I'm glad you did say that, even if I disagree with you. It's important. Yeah, that, and we right. should fight for the right for people to say things that we don't even like, right? I may not agree with what you say, but I'll fight for your right to say it. Amen. Brother. Within some Amen. extent, I'll say okay, it. What can I say? How much money do we spend on our public school system, kindergarten through the eighth grade, how much how much money goes into the college system, taxpayer money? How many government backed student loans are there? Of course, now they're demanding we gotta we gotta make those all free. We need a free indoctrination post high school, and we need it free. Because it's just not fair. It's systemic racism, systemic whatever, poverty, whatever the systemic thing of the week is. This is where our money goes. This is where we are investing into the future, which is really investing into the destruction of our nation, our infrastructure, and our ability to think for ourselves and even meet our own needs. We have kids today that are so dependent upon their devices. Their devices know everything. In California, we're just talking about that university in California. They're talking about advanced mathematics classes, you know, essentially being racist. Because, you know, certain kids don't do well in math, so it's got to be it's got to be the math that is racist. Instead of trying to raise the standards and help everybody, the new idea from these education bureaucrats, idiots, and reprobates is to dumb everybody else down. We are, I'm recording this program. We'll be back on the road, on the way to Georgia. But as I record this program, I'm in Florida. There's a lot about Florida I like. I love the governor of this state who's not putting up with some of the COVID silliness that comes out of Washington, D.C., 
and our absent-minded president of the United States. And I say that because I think he's absent of mind very often in what he's doing. And that should be a concern to anybody, regardless of your political party. He's not in charge. If you think he's in charge, you're a fool. You're an absolute fool. He spends his weekend at his home in Delaware. He may think he's home in Delaware during the week, for all we know. Only guy I know that has a few appointments in the morning, and then they put a lid on it for the day. What's that tell you about this White House compared to any White House I'm aware of in the last 60 years? Probably longer. We have a figurehead. But enough on that. The educational system in this country is very expensive. Here in our part of Florida, I estimated based upon the number of students and everything else, they're spending 20 some odd thousand dollars for every every student kindergarten through the 12th grade. If you divide the number of students total, oh, I'm sure a little bit more spent in high school than elementary, but but you follow what I'm saying. There's a lot of money spent for these kids in the classroom. And what are we seeing? What have we seen over the past 10, 20, 30 years? There has been a systematic decline in education. Now, it's wonderful that our school district here has some excellent opportunities that I wish I could have had back when I was in high school Advanced computer, of course, really didn't have computers in the home yet, but they even have television production and other pretty, pretty incredible things you can do. And and they do that, thankfully, in our district. We have that program. Students that keep up good grades can get to that. But I also noticed that some of the other standards in the school have been somewhat lessened over the past 20 years, 30 years. Why? Well, we've got to keep the graduating numbers up. We have they have special programs now for kids that are just not able to cut it. They're not they're not getting their work done for various reasons, including laziness. Or they don't care or they don't want to. They don't feel like it. They have these last ditch effort programs for for many. I'm glad that they do. But at what cost? And so the the cost of education goes up. The quality of the product keeps going down. This is one of my concerns. I think of what college was like when I attended. I went to both a what's called a technical school and then a college. And when I got to that technical school, it was pretty obvious to me (laughs) on day one. Number one, you're paying for this. Number two, you can show up if you want or stay home if you want. But you're never going to graduate. You're never going to get your certificate. You're never going to get anywhere. You know, it's your money, and you've got to make a a decision on what's important in your life. The same was true in college when I got to, to to a university level. I was able to maintain good grades. Why? Number one, I realized it was important. Number two, I realized it was expensive. I actually had a vested interest in this. I I couldn't just throw the money away, which kids today feel they can. They don't like something. They just don't do it. They don't participate. And we spend a lot of money on these things. But the quality of education has gone down. California, like I say, calling advanced mathematics racist. So rather than inspire others to try to go up to the next level. They just get rid of that level and try to keep everybody else lower. I don't know how that's going to solve any problems. I don't know if I want people that are going into the building or construction or engineering trade lacking in mathematics. May not be a smart idea. But this is the direction that we as a nation have been heading consistently now for decades. I can remember Phyllis Schlafly. She used to do a little short radio commentary every day, the Phyllis Schlafly Report. And she talked about where education was going. And she talked about this in the late 1980s and 90s. And and even then, as I worked in radio and heard this, I'm going, what is she talking about? I, I couldn't 
I didn't conceive it, at least not in the community where I lived or not the communities that I had been raised within and the education that I had received. But she was right. And she was laying out where certain organizations were heading, especially when Bill Clinton got elected and the teachers unions became more empowered and the idea of using educational education to advance political ideology as indoctrination started becoming acceptable in certain cities and communities. Now, it wouldn't have flown where I was living at the time, 30 some odd years ago, but it would fly in Los Angeles or Chicago, New York, just to name a few little towns, Baltimore, any any major Democrat-run city, unionized city, anyone that's looking for strange social justice arguments, these things sounded palatable. Some even had the idea of school to work, to be little happy drones in your job. And it just reminds me of Klaus Schwab, you know, good old Klaus from the World Economic Forum, where you will own nothing and you will like it. You will own nothing. We will own everything. But you'll be happy. And if you're not happy, we will kill you. This is exactly what they believe. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not, I'm not inventing Dr. Evil here. He, he really is Dr. Evil, Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum. Great global reset. If you want the truth, every time you look at how communism is sold to the people to bring it on board, I want you to think about this carefully. I have another story I'm going to share with you after the bottom of the hour break and then some other stuff. But but I want you to notice, it's always sold as a bill of goods about equality for everybody. It's equality. It's to make everything equal. Yeah, make everybody equally miserable. That's the whole idea. The truth is, when you come into nations run by dictators, you have those that have and everybody has little or nothing George Orwell another book that he wrote besides 1984 Animal Farm well guess what the idea that all animals are created equal but eventually it was written in some are more equal than others do you believe in the work that we're doing here at Truth to Ponder I really believe in the use of shortwave and we want to really expand it working on some projects this summer that should very much increase our shortwave outreach across North America. I believe that shortwave is becoming increasingly vital. It is not controlled by Google. It is not controlled by Facebook. It is not controlled by YouTube. It's controlled totally out of their hands. While this program does operate as a podcast, I'm always prepared to take it elsewhere or take it offline entirely if that day should ever come. But I really believe that that shortwave is going to be most likely the number one way this program is distributed. Thinking about some other things that I'm going to talk about in the next half hour, uh, along with the break and, and some other news that I think you really need to hear. I've got a really, really incredible story that you've got to read. And you got to hear. And I want to share it with you in just a few moments. But if you believe in the work, would you consider giving it a little bit of financial support for the airtime? We we pay for the airtime. I am not paid. I'm not making any money out of this. And if you'd like to help, make the check out to Ancient War Radio. Our mailing address is 21 Berkshire, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane. And we are located in Sky Valley, two words. Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. Let me make sure I got that address right, because I think I forgot to add something to that. 21 Berkshire Lane, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, Berkshire Lane. Then add this number, 263, on that line. Number 263. In the little tiny town of Sky Valley, we don't have mail generally delivered to our homes, uh, unless it's a package. And so they have these secure boxes. 
and ours happens to be number 263 in Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. We will be right back after this break. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. The first love. Shalom Aleichem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment. Today, the word is Ahava. It's Hebrew for love. It's beautiful. Try it. Ahava. Now, love is so important. It's the key. It's what the Bible's all about. When When is the first time the word love occurs in the Bible? It's Genesis 22, when God says to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. This is the first love of the Bible, the very first appearance of the word love in the Bible. It's speaking about the love of a father for his son. This is awesome stuff. You see, the Bible is about the love of a father for a son, God the Father, for God the Son. This is the first love. This is the first love of the universe. This is the love that makes all other loves possible, the love of the Father and the Son. It's by that love we're saved. And within that love, we're born again. So it's that love that has to be the basis of our love. What kind of love is it? Well, what kind of love is it in Genesis 22? It's the love of a father letting go. It's the love of a father letting go of his son, ultimately his son on Calvary. It's a sacrificial love. It's not a love that demands or needs or requires or loves only to get back. It's a love that gives up and lets go. It's perfect. It's unconditional. It's sacrificial love. See, true love is an offering to give without seeking anything back. So with what love are you to love with in your life? The same love, the love that demands nothing back, expects nothing, lets go, sacrifices everything. Love someone today with the unconditional love, expecting nothing back. Bless somebody today with total sacrificial giving, selfless love, because this is the first love. This is the agape. This is Ahava. This is Calvary. This is Messiah. This is our salvation. And this is our faith. Want more? Ask for love notes. Now, if somebody offered you a gift of a million dollars, what would you say? Well, something better than a million dollars, something that'll help give you a strong, victorious life in God, a free subscription to Sapphire's Vitamins for Your Spirit, and the incredible Mystery of the Temple Doors, all free. You'll love it. How do you get all this? Easy. Just remember Jesus' real Hebrew name, Yeshua, and dial it. Just dial 1-800-YESHUA-1. It's all you do. You'll be so blessed, but call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. Now, the harvest is great. The laborers, though, are few. I invite you to join me in the harvest. You don't need a plow, just an open heart and a pen, and you can reach the unreached peoples of this world. Just call now, 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Or write me direct, the nice Jewish boy, Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, the zip 07644. Well, till next time, this is Jonathan Kahn saying Shalom Alechem. Peace be to you, my friend and Messiah, Ben Elohim, the Son of God. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to part two of our Thursday edition of Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. As I was going into the break, I was wanting to thank all of you that, that take the time to let me know that you listen. A lot of you have been sending me emails of late. And yes, I know a lot of you send some video clips. I, I get a chance to see most of them, not all, but most. Some I'm trying to find ways that I can use, and but the information is always appreciated. So don't think, if I don't write you right back, uh, that I, I'm ignoring you. This past, what's supposed to have been a few-day trip, became uh, a two-week trip, a little over two weeks. And we've been trying to work from on the road, and, and, and oftentimes it's not as easy to, to respond as I'd like to. And we'll have a way to do it later this summer when we're here at a more extended, for a more extended time. But for now, just so you understand, it's not that we're ignoring you. Uh, it's just the way things are at the moment. But I want to thank you for, for contacting the show either by email or even with the regular mail. And I gave you the address before. I'll give it again before the end of the program. Like I say, I've been doing some reading while we've been down here in Florida just to get an idea of what's going on in the world. And sometimes I, I don't get as much time to read as I like. But I ran across this story, 
And, and I thought about this. I ran across this story, and I find it deeply concerning. And I think that you're going to find it equally as concerning as well. Let me see if I can just get right here to the beginning of it. Here we go. Naomi Wolf, who was a former advisor to the Clinton administration, is a prolific author and a Yale University graduate. She also received a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship that allowed her to complete her Ph.D. in English and literature at Oxford University back in 2015, six years ago. Eight years before that, she actually wrote a book called The End of America. Now, The End of America was published back in 07. And obviously, she saw the light. And, and even though her politics, I, I know, lean toward hmm, the Democrat side, she's become more of a pragmatic person. It's pretty obvious in her book, too. She warned us where we're, we're heading. In her book, she points out, that would-be tyrants are found on both sides of the political spectrum. And and you may not want to believe that, but I have to agree. I, I fully agree. She is totally correct on that. She really is. We have tyrants on both sides of the political spectrum. We saw that during the pandemic. Some so-called Republican freedom-loving governors locking down just as bad as a Cuomo in New York, even as evidence was mounting the lockdowns don't work. They really didn't do anything. But I think even people... Look, Mitt Romney claims to be a conservative. That's laughable, in my opinion. He's an opportunist, statist, elitist. Period. End of discussion. I only voted for him in 2012 because, well, think what what the other choice was at the time. Not much of a choice. Now, in her book, The End Times of America, she lays out, Wolf lays out the 10 steps toward tyranny. Now, what I was trying to point out before the break, and she says it so well, that every tyrant that ever lived, ever will walk the face of the earth. Some get there by revolution, but a lot of them, a lot of them get there using the system. 1920s. In Italy, Germany, 1930s, East Germany in the 1950s, Chile in the 1970s, China, even later. They all took the 10 steps, not a 12-step plan, the 10-step plan, and it always seems to work. I've warned people, when you start seeing these 10 steps in progress, you have to take action while you still have a chance because there's no way to recover once things get too far without a revolution, a bloody revolution, or even a civil war. Few people, I think a lot of people today don't understand that that people like Mussolini and Hitler came to power in legal working democracies at the time. Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. People forget that. They forget that while his rabble-rousing group was busting some skulls in, in Munich, what they were really doing was selling the idea they had a way to do it. They had a Germany that had been decimated in World War I, and the Treaty of Versailles put the German people in a very perilous way for decades and decades to come. Their economy had collapsed. Their money was worthless. They had no, they had nothing. And so a person like a Hitler talking about rebuilding Germany, rebuilding our industry, making, you know, building a better life, at least that's what he claimed, made it possible for him to say, look at all the bad that has happened because of, vote for the Nationalist Socialist Party, and we will put you, you know, we'll we'll make things better again and get even with that world around us that took so much from us. She claims, in a recent interview, Naomi Wolf, she claims that we are now at step 10. People have said since the, the book was written, tell us when we're at step 10. I've always said things are bad, they're getting worse, 
There's still hope. But we're literally coming on to step 10 right now. I've been trying to warn people tirelessly, is what she says, that we are at step 10. And once step 10 locks in and is complete, short of a revolution or a war, you're not going back. The 10 step toward tyranny starts with the invocation of a terrifying internal and or external threat. It may be a real threat. It may be an imagined one. It may be well blown out of proportion. COVID-19! COVID-19! However, pretty much in all cases, you'll find over history that they were hyped up threats. Even, look, I hate to say this, and I, I hope you understand. It was Rahm Emanuel that said back during the Clinton years, never let a good crisis go to waste. That's happened with this pandemic. It happened even after 9-11 that the fear of terror was used to take away many of our civil liberties and rights. And we got a FISA court, which has been abused terribly over these past 20 years. Step 10. Step 10, she says, involves the creation of a surveillance state where citizens end up being spied upon by their own government and others. And, of course, nowadays they'll just enlist Google and everybody else to do the, the dirty work for the government. Oh, the government's not spying on you. It's, it's Facebook. We just, happen to buy, we just happen to buy the mind data from them to learn all about you and the vaccine passports. Ah, yes, I saw this commercial for, I guess, was Samuel Adams beer. And it's kind of like this guy's going to go in there to get his shot. It's it's supposed to be funny like a dumb guy. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, do I get the shot in my rear? No, no, in the arm. And then they're showing, see, as soon as you have your shot, you get back to the bar with your buddies and you can drink Samuel Adams again. Of course, it was kind of funny. The gal wearing the big face covering and face shield and, and everything else. Okay, you still need to wear your mask. I sometimes wonder if the left will ever let go of the shaming mask that that keeps people in such control. I can remember watching videos. You'd see somebody, you know, like in, uh, oh, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Some guy wearing his shorts and his pink shirt from New York. And he sees somebody 50 feet away not wearing a face mask. And they get all belligerent and they become like whiny little girls screaming, you got to put your mask on, put your mask on. And they're, they're chasing people around. These people are certifiably crazy. I'm done with the mask myself. I've had enough. I'm not, I've done enough reading and research to realize we've known for 30 years it works. It does not work for a virus. If it did, we've been doing this during the flu season, but we don't. This is made up junk science to give you fear. Stop and think. Go back a year ago. Go back a year ago. Zoom. (laughs) They made out like bandits. Nintendo, Microsoft, Amazon. All those companies that jumped right on board are the ones that made the big benefit. And a few of the big box stores. And when you look at like Microsoft, Amazon, and the the big tech players. They coordinated together, including Google, to make sure wherever you go on the Internet, and as you go platform to platform, yep, every time you look somewhere online, even Facebook today, there's always a warning about... COVID-19! COVID-19! And along with the warnings, there's always censorship. If If you say anything positive about, oh, I don't know, ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine or other known medicines that really do work, if you're not into the vaccine only, if you're not into wearing face masks and living in fear and locking down only, the big tech multi-billionaires will crush you and they will attempt to silence you. You know something? I get this garbage all the time from Facebook. They want me to put a little frame around my profile picture saying, I've got the vaccine. How about you? (laughs) How about you just stop sending me this garbage because I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to have that profile picture. No, thank you. I'm simply not interested. 
I got news for you. If people are gathering in churches, if they're gathering in real school rooms, if they're going to walks together again, if they're going to picnics, if they're having dinner with their friends, not just a a little hot dog that, that Mr. Biden may let us have on the 4th of July with two or three of our neighbors at a distance, of course, socially distanced, probably wearing a mask too. If if we're getting together as people again, it takes away their power over you. But if they can successfully drive you back indoors and terrify you from being around other people, I think of some people I know, this one gal, she's somehow a friend of mine on Facebook. I've got thousands of them, but in her case, she's just a nice little gal, never married, lives at home with her mother. She's in her like late 30s. And she misses going to church, but she's she wants everybody to get the vaccine so she can go back to church. She believes the vaccine will save her and her little church. If you need a vaccine to save your church, <laughs> you're serving the wrong God. I'm telling you, this, this fear, we the state is more important than the church. If these tech tyrants and governments can terrify you, or make it unlawful to be around other people through emergency powers that restrict the assembly. Well, number one, Google and all the big companies profit because they've got you learning online. Digital learning, by the way, stinks. But you know something? Millions upon millions of dollars went to one company. And countries are already beginning to talk about lockdowns. Yep, that's all they got. And I begin to think that some of these governors, like, you know, Governor Whitmire, Governor Cuomo, Governor Murphy, and I I think there's dozens of others like it. Governor Newsom, I hope, that gets uh, recalled. I'm telling you, I think the power's gone to their head, and they are literally, they are literally getting pleasure out of the pain they put upon you. They're very sick individuals. They have no business being in government. With lockdowns being lifted in some places, you know what's so funny? I can remember, and I don't want to go too long in this segment here. I've got something I do want to share with you. When Florida started opening up, when when Governor Kemp in, in Georgia, then, though he's a fool when it came to the election, he was correct in how he dealt with a lot of this virus. Notice the states that are not locking down are doing so much better than the ones that keep talking about locking down. There are actually people now that are afraid of the lockdowns ending. Did you hear about that? Now that they're being lifted, there are people that are worrying about getting rid of the lockdowns. They're they're afraid to socialize normally again. This, This year of fear has caused some really terrible psychological issues for many. You can look up, there's, a, there's an article in Cosmopolitan of all places pointing out, does anybody else have anxiety about ending the lockdowns? And, and this individual is happy to be locked down in their home. Wow. They're, they, as they say, they're, they like working at home in their comfort zone, which is another way of saying safe space. Something synonymous with weirdo leftist thinking and their perpetual quest for comfort emotionally and physically and everything else. People that can think for themselves can't wait for the lockdowns to end and they defy them or they've had enough with them. We're we're not participating in your little stupid game any longer. Boise State University found that compliance with lockdown and, and government pandemic recommendations is pretty well split across political lines. If you are conservative and can think for yourself, you've had enough. And if you can't think for yourself and you vote Democrat, you're willing to, you're, you're willing to be locked down for the rest of your life. In other words, left-leaning sheep, incapable of critical thinking, are blindly following whatever whatever the government tells them to do without question, without any question, and never questioning the likes of Fauci. You know, they they say that when people come out of prison, it takes them a while to learn to 
be able to accept freedom again. I think we're having that occur now with some people. COVID-19, a lot of people are protected by their own antibodies that they, they made without even knowing it. There's a lot about this that makes no sense. And then lastly, I've got an article. I may wait till tomorrow to, to share this one. This this needs to be shared, and I'm not going to have time for it today because I have something else I want to share. I have mentioned the idea of building maybe a direct uh, satellite, you know, direct-to-home satellite free-to-air channel. I'm looking at it. It may occur as soon as end of June, middle of June, maybe July. We're praying about it. And I'll also build a streaming radio station for those that don't mind picking up the music stream. And, and, I, and some of the music is going to be old hymns. Some will be newer material, a lot like this. All of creation sings, star of the morning. Praise to the risen King, star of the morning. People shout it, here comes the King. As you march down the road to Jerusalem, there were tears in your eyes. The same ones who cheered, yell, yeah, crucify. Could hold you down On that third day You rose from the ground When Jesus our Lord comes for you and me I know that the term uh, new music is is relative uh, when you're my age. I think back to when I was in my my teens or 20s and remember Leon Patillo singing Star of the Morning. Yeah, I know it's 45, 50 years ago. But we all will have some newer music in in the mix that is very recent. And then some classic recordings you don't hear much anymore and hymns that really can make a difference in your life. I I mentioned the other day 
guy that I worked with at, at the Call Falls College radio station WRAF, Frank Nagel, he passed away a number of years ago. Born in 1912, he worked well into his 80s on the air and enjoyed every minute of it. And he would talk about the difference between a hymn and a gospel song. Now, gospel song could be any kind of a Christian song. And let's just use the the meaning that it is a Christ-centered song, not just some fuzzy Christian message. I'm talking about a song that has really solid theology. I like a lot of the newer music that has that. I love the classics of the faith. I even love some of the Americana hymnology, as it's called. And I would like to be able to share this kind of a channel because no one seems to want to play it anymore. The world has gone all mass-marketed music. That's what it is, mass-marketed music that talks about him or I want to know you or more about that or somebody or something. You can't tell if this is a contemporary Christian song or a contemporary secular song talking about somebody's boyfriend or girlfriend. I want music, regardless of when it came out, multi-generational, that can edify the body of Christ, where there is a true message in the music, regardless of the music style. So yeah, how about a mixture? How about an online or direct to home satellite kind of program or radio station that plays that kind of music and not only plays that kind of music but features programs like this and some and some teaching programs you simply can't get anywhere else I really believe God has called up some people to do a lot of things in this world and we need to do our part in this very uncertain time We need to find ways of staying connected as community. That's why this program is on shortwave. I'm not depending upon, even though the program, I think, can still be found on a few sites like a YouTube, and you can even get a link from Facebook. Those those days are going to end. You know it, and I know it. I'm there taunting them every day, and I don't care. I really don't care anymore. If my plug gets pulled, so be it. I'll, I'll consider that a badge of honor. I'm there as long as I can be until I have to go somewhere else. That's why shortwave is vital, and I really believe it's important. I'm thinking a secondary is going to be, you know, using the free-to-air satellite systems. Little, it's like a three-foot dish, not huge. And you own the receiver, and there's no monthly charge. There's other Christian programs there besides what I'll put up. A lot of Christian radio, even some Christian TV. Some I like, some not so much. But it certainly beats some of the garbage coming in the cable system these days or even over the air. These are just thoughts in my mind right now. And I want to keep us connected together. Shortwave number one. This next way of of getting to people, number two. And we'll use the podcast and online for as long as the vehicle is there. Someday it's it's going to be gone like it's been for LifeSight and others. I know that day's coming, but I want to start preparing for those days today. Do you believe in the work that we're doing here at Truth to Ponder? Tomorrow I've got some interesting stories about why kids should never wear a face mask anywhere, anytime, for any government, period. And why I consider it almost sinful. If you believe in what we're doing, maybe you want to support us, consider it possibly. You can... Make a check out to Ancient Word Radio. Mail it to 21 Berkshire Lane, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E. 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263 in Sky Valley, Georgia, zip code 30537. We will be back tomorrow. God bless. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.